So how about non-fabric selective porosities? Well, we have fractures as a potential non-fabric selective porosity. And of course, non-fabric selective porosity, fracture being a good example of this, always are secondary. They are never present here at time of deposition. So that's why we don't distinguish between primary and secondary for not, for not fabric selective porosity. So here we have fractures. This is an outcrop scale fracture, but you can have them also at the thin section scale. We can also have channels, which are effectively fractured that were dissolved. So here's an example of a channel. We can have VUGs. VUGs are an important type of porosity. Now, a VUG is a dissolution feature like the moldic porosity wears. It's also a dissolution feature, but the difference is a VUG cross-cuts the fabric of the rock. So here you can see that the VUG, in this case, is cross-cutting the OUID. It's not following the, the pattern of the OUID. So that's an important distinction. And finally, we can have cavern porosity. And cavern porosity essentially designate a man size or larger porosity uh, of a channel or vogue shape. Okay, so that's a very large dissolution feature that is termed a cavern porosity. Now that brings us to an interesting topic. There are porosities that you can either qualify as fabric selective or you can qualify as, as not fabric selective, depending on your point of view. Let me show you. The first one that we encounter is breccia porosity. So breccia porosity is the porosity between the breccia fragments. Now, this is a, this is a fabric selective porosity if you consider that the fabric of the rock is the breccia itself. In that case, it's fabric selective. But if you consider that the fabric of the rock is the fabric of the component of the rock, so the limestone blocks within the breccia, then that porosity between those primary components becomes a secondary porosity. So we can't really determine which one of the two it is. Another type of porosity that can be either fabric selective or not are boring or burrows. It can be considered as fabric selective because they're here at time of deposition and so they form their own fabric within the rock. But you could consider that the sediment or the, the rock had to be here before the borrowers or before the boring organisms. So then it becomes a not fabric selective porosity because it cross cuts the fabric of the rock. So again, either one is correct. And finally, shrinkage porosity or mud cracks can also be considered as either primary or not. It's primary if you consider that it was, or sorry, it's, it's fabric selective if you consider that it was here at time of deposition, or it's not fabric selective if you consider that the mud themselves represent the fabric of the rock. And here's a nice example of one of those mud cracks. One thing that is not at all accounted for in this choke it and pray classification is the so-called microporosity. Because choke it and pray is based on thin section and you cannot see microporosity on thin sections. But here you can see that in carbonate grains, we can have tremendous amounts of porosity. So for instance, if you look at the benthic forum, this is a, an eocene numulate here, you can put this under an SEM and you will see that within the framework of the shell itself, you have a lot of really, really, really small porosity you know, in the order of a few micron here, maybe 50 micron or less. And even if you look at mud, at micrite, micrite is usually made of aragonite and these aragonite are rod shaped uh, crystals. And in between these crystals, you can have micron scale porosity. So carbonates can have a lot of porosity and that micro porosity is not present in the classification I've shown you, but it is a very important porosity for some reservoirs, especially in the Middle East. The problem, of course, is how do you extract fluids from such a small porosity? And that, that's a challenge and something that, you know, is beyond the scope of this class today. So that brings me to my summary. What have we seen in this class? Well, first of all, 
we use the Chocolate and Prey classification as our standard classification. This is an important one to know. It is a genetic classification, which means that from this classification, you can understand how the porosity was formed. The key is to determine whether the porosity was fabric selective or not. The problem though, is that even though this is a great classification to talk about the, the history of diagenesis or the history of porosity or to understand a mature field, it's very difficult to predict permeability based on chocolate and prey. In fact, you can't predict permeability based on just chocolate and prey. And that's a challenge that we will tackle in our next class.